for the election to take place on May 7, 2015. Um, I'm Wendy, I'm a member of the Centre and Alpha Movement who arranged this. And um, really, I have to think it's to give you, it's a traditional thing, it's been going a long time, it's to give you a chance to really meet the candidates, eyeball them, find out what it is they stand for, see whether you like the way they interact with each other. And, uh, so, that's us. The technical matters are that the timekeeping will be needed to be kept fairly strict. This is Brian who's going to be doing that bit, um, so that we fit it into the next hour. All of the questions sent tonight have been sent in advance by email, um, but I think at the end we're going to see if there's time for another couple that we've been handed during the evening. That will depend on how things go, rather. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce the candidates. At this end we have Fran Lloyd from UKIP. We have James Stevenson, an independent parliamentary candidate. We have Gary Lipton, the Conservative. Antonia Zenkovich from the Green Party. We have Seb Saw, also an independent. Uh, we should have David uh, Mellon, who's our councillor and uh, is standing for, in for Chris Leslie this evening. He may arrive later, I don't know. Um, that space is for him when he does. And also we have Kathy Meadows, who's um, standing for the council, I believe, for the Trades Unionist Socialist Coalition. Is that right? Okay. So I'll hand you over to Brian Rooney. Brian is um, chair of the Labour Forum and he's a member of Stenton Alchemy. I think he's quite well. Well, oh, thank you very much indeed, Wendy. Let's kick off straight away. So, the delegates, we haven't got much time, you've been hosting before, so I'll try and keep things moving along as fast as we can. But we'll give you enough time to actually give your answers. So, I'll start with the first one, which was an asylum. This is from the Women's Culture Exchange. <clears throat> People have been unfairly and forcibly deported and not given a chance to appeal their cases. There have been experienced situations where people have been detained with their prior knowledge about their case. The case has been refused, whereby not given time to prepare any evidence. What right does asylum seekers have when claims are refused, they're treated as criminals, they assess cases on merit, Yet when evidence is genuinely presented, they accept it and refuse the case. In the next election, what will your policies be and how would you seek to address these, these issues? Film first. Thank you. Yes, the problem with um, asylum seekers. Well, uh, Asylum seekers should be welcome. We've come to this country. Sorry? No problem, no, so they're welcome. Can you let me kind of speak first before we start to the case? So, yeah, there is a problem with the perception of asylum seekers that we do have legal um, asylum seekers and then there's the illegal um, asylum seekers. So, when there's an appeal put in, the evidence should be checked, should be verified, and people who are, who are kept here, they should be actually treated as humane. Um, in the main manner. Now we've heard in Paul, so there is like a camp where people are, have uh, appalling conditions, and that's completely wrong. You know, you know, people are human beings and need to be treated with respect and dignity. Um, but what should we do? In the next parliament, UKIP will process asylums in a, in, in a fair and equal manner. Um, if they are deemed to be illegal, they will be sent back. If they are deemed to for appeal, and um, it should be a fair case, and if they are granted an asylum, they're here to stay and we'll be better off for it. But it has to be done fairly. Thank you. Thank you, James? Yeah, well, I'm all in favour of having, making sure that there's a robust system in place so that asylum seekers do come for whatever reason, have access to a fair trial, a fair, afforded due process um, in, their, in their claims. Um, I, there, I believe there is, we're very slow at processing asylum claims. Um, I would like to focus on speeding up the process but in a fair and objective way. But to just say that we, you know, to say, to brush people as asylum seekers, I think everybody has to be treated on an individual case-by-case -case basis. We can pr present their evidence and can process under the, the just and the jurisdiction of the, of the courts in the United Kingdom. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, I, I agree with what you just said. Uh, asylum seekers, it's on in each individual merit. What we have to remember that these are people, and they come over to this country, they're either looking for a future because they've had it really terrible in their own country. Now, this is something I believe not only citizens are in favour of, and I support them as well. So, um, we also have to remember I work with 47 different nationalities, I work for co op. And we have to remember that asylum seekers, when they come over to this country, a lot of them have a lot to give to this country, and we need to be looking at that. So, yeah, it's in each individual merit, we treat them, treat them with respect and make sure that uh, we look after them where, where they need them. Hello, um, there's an awful lot of anti-immigration, um, anti-asylum seekers speak um, that, that goes on and part of that is because uh, they can't vote. Asylum seekers and an awful lot of migrants can't vote and there's an awful lot that's in this system that instead of looking at the problems of austerity and the problems of the cuts and the problems of privatisation, it's far easier to blame people that come here. We've got the problem of the boats where people desperately seeking safety have not been helped because we do not see them as people. The Green Party is different. We understand that, that Britain has always been a culture of migration, always and that um, asylum is a right that we need to keep as well. I've worked um, personally as an interfaith women's worker in the past and have visited Yarlswood and petitioned to get a local woman out who was taken off the streets and wasn't given medicine for high blood pressure. So I've been working at the front line of this ridiculous rhetoric on anti anyone who wasn't born here. So yes, there's a lot more that I could say. We need, uh, we need to help people that are here because they're asylum seekers and we also need a more adult and less blame, blaming my, migration system which is both fair and fast and unbiased. Hello. Um, you asked about policy. Um, for me personally, I don't think it's necessarily a matter about policy, uh, more about attitudes. Uh, I struggle with the word asylum and when we talk about legal and illegal, because I don't understand how a human being can be illegal or illegal. Um, I think we're in a very fortunate position in this country where we actually um, have the capability to look after people and we should try and empower and enable people and look after people for, because they're a human, not because they fit certain labels that we uh, put them into. Um, I would also question how our, uh, how our politics actually represents us when we're talking about like, uh, you know, people who are fleeing other lands to come here. For example, if Chris Leslie was here, I would be berating him about talking the talk about these kind of things, ending detention centres, but well, when he was MP for Shipley, he voted to erode civil liberties, he voted to invade another country against the will of the people of this country and the will of the international community. And I think, you know, if our foreign policy had been more reflective of our wishes, we wouldn't have all this scaremongering about people coming here to seek, to seek refuge. Go on, go on, go on. Is David still here? Would you, would you mind stop that one on the podium instead of David? Okay, thank you. My Kathy, Hi. Um, yeah, so the UK have signed the UN Declaration on Human Rights, which means that um, anyone can come to the UK and um, claim asylum. And the asylum system is part of our, is part of democracy. I think, and many asylum seekers who are fleeing are fleeing because they've stood up in their own country for human rights, or they're trade unionists, um, or they've stood up for women's rights, and so on. And it's really important that there is an asylum system so that there is a chance for them to flee 
when they have to. Um, the Arab Spring, you know, all our leaders hailed the Arab Spring, said great, you know, democracy um, going across that region. Uh, but now when, you know, the, the Arab Spring has turned into civil war and conflict and people are fleeing to Europe uh, from Libya, they're saying let's take military action against the smugglers' boats so that they can't flee here. Aleppo in Syria is, uh, the UN said, is the most dangerous city in the world. And that's where many of the refugees are coming from. They're coming through to Libya, across the Mediterranean, to Italy. Uh, so, um, and, and I think, um, I think, so I think asylum, the asylum system is really important. It's part of um, our democracy. And I think that um, when people talk about migrants and immigration, uh, it's really important to um, think about how you talk about it. Uh, because people, initially in the media, they were referring to these refugees from Libya as migrants. Uh, as though they were, you know, risking their lives to get a job here, which is which is ridiculous. There's people who are fleeing bombing. I, I heard that um, the children who witnessed beheadings and so on, you know, completely traumatised. Um, so I forgot what I was going to say. Yeah, and um, actually we had a demonstration yesterday at Tusk uh, about. Oh, sorry, is that it? Yeah. I'm not talking to the table. Anyone else going to talk about any, any other? Uh, what the so, uh, James, would you like to see if there's anything you want to say about Nelson's statements? I just want to add that I don't think we need to get, we shouldn't get so drawn into saying that our help or our assistance from the United Kingdom should be limited to accepting people to come here. Oh, my So, so, can everyone hear me now? Yeah. I was just, I was going to add that I don't think we should view our, you know, our assistance, the United Kingdom's assistance in this, um, in terms of asylum seekers, as saying that we limit it to how many people that we accept to come into the United Kingdom. I think it's multifaceted. We need to be seeing how much we can help our partners in the region, such as Jordan, who have taken in a lot of refugees from Syria, to see what can we do to help, help at, at source and next to source. Yeah, I'd also like to add, um, in terms of uh, the detention centres, uh, that, that's actually a growing industry at the moment, believe it or not. Um, they're becoming bigger and you've got children being detained as well. <coughs> I've seen it. Um, we would close deten most of the detention centres. The only reason why people should be detained is because it is if they're a danger to, to others. We do not need detention centres in, in, uh, in, in this process. Um, they are largely inhumane, and when I was there um, in Yardswood, they were all white guards and all uh, largely, largely black and um, minority ethnic groups um, behind the bars. Um, we also need to look at things like climate change and conflict resolution and how we act as, as a nation um, in the rest of the world and how we are helping to create problems including with selling arms and all sorts of things Can we that lead to yeah, sorry, that, no, it does lead to the problems where people then end up having to come and seek refuge. Just to pick up again on something we said brought up, and it's not talked about enough, and that is our disastrous foreign policy. We wouldn't have a, such a problem today if it wasn't that past and present governments have voted in to bomb Afghaz Afghanistan, Iraq, um, Libya, and, you know, only a couple of years ago, there was hell bent on bombing Syria, you know, so a change of attitude in our foreign policy would go a long way, but unfortunately what we're going to give the establishment parties is more war. I, I tend to agree a little bit with what you said. We shouldn't have gone into uh, Iraq at all. You know, we, we keep part of the countries. What happens? You go bomb somebody, and straight away they're your enemy, aren't they? So you know, we're totally against uh, war at all. So let's get around the table and talk on 
trying to bomb somebody out of their existence. Thank you. Um, welcome to David. Good evening, Brian. So this is David Mallon, Don Brownie, who's uh, uh, representing Chris Leslie in the Labour Party. Thank you. So we have a second question. It's on sanctions. There are increasing numbers of people that have been sanctioned by WP that are being forced to use food banks. This impact on their families often with young children. What are your views on sanctioning? And what will you, will you do if you become a local MP to address this? If you would support sanctioning, why? James, first, please. Um, in my very well, very limited knowledge of sanctioning, what you just explained to me, I would, the way I would approach it is that if I am employed, I'm expected to meet certain tasks, to do certain things get my paycheck or to make progress in the company. I think we can't just have a system where it's a free-for-all. I mean, there need to be systems in place for people to meet certain targets or have certain commitments in order to receive welfare from the government. That's my position. Yeah, um, food banks have been in the papers a lot recently. We've had this, uh, there's a million people claiming um, going to food banks and now we're saying that there's only half a million because we've been counted twice. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, I'm not going to comment on that. Um, what happens is, is that, when, from what I gather, you go to the job centre and you're offered a, a food voucher for a food bank and that wasn't done under the previous Labour government, they kept that under the counter. This is what's happening. What I see is that we should have a, a welfare system where nobody can fall below a certain level, like a cradle. And then, so we need some sort of welfare to make sure people are looked after. I'm, I'm a, a local representative, and if people, if people have got issues, local issues, then I want to know about it. Now I'll go out and help them as much as I can. So that's how I'm on that. Thank you. Thank you. And so new. Hi, um, this is um, another form of scapegoating really, isn't it? Um, I've heard that um, food banks are again growth industry, more people are using them than ever before. And in fact, an awful lot of those people are working, but not um, with not having a living wage and on zero hours or low paid contracts. So when living wage, and getting rid of uh, exploitative zero hours contracts are part of that. Saying no to the austerity agenda is massive and um, all the sanctions are part of that. Uh, at the moment we have a system where the people who can least afford it are footing the bill for um, banking and national problems when the quantitative easing, there's been hundreds of billions that have gone into quantitative easing, far more than the deficit ever was. And it's people that are on ATOS that have gone on ATOS, people that are in the benefit system, to be, um, partly because of cuts, partly because of cuts in the public sector, partly because of jobs, job cuts, and then they are basically victimised. We have to end that. We have to end austerity and look at things like the Robin Hood tax and a wealth tax of one percent on the top one percent. These things can generate hundreds of millions of pounds, particularly the Robin Hood tax that is in 11 countries in Europe at the moment and can generate hundreds of billions from the banks rather than us bailing the banks out, which means that the people that are at the lowest, are on the lowest income, including people that are in unpaid work, domestic care work, volunteer work, all of those things are not victimised. We also want to move towards a system where um, we have a welfare system that doesn't fall into benefits traps, where you have a basic income for everybody, which we would hope to be able to do within a couple of parliaments. Unfortunately, we're not able to do that yet. Uh, so I've had a lot of conversations with people uh, who, uh, you know, who find themselves unemployed and having to seek uh, job seeking allowance and kind of, uh, things like that. And the overwhelming uh, feedback that you get is actually 
they fall into a system that doesn't care about them, whether they're getting sanctioned or not. Is this is the the JSA and the Job Centre is they're meant to be trying to empower people and enable people to, to help them to get back and find employment. But actually, the system is useless. It doesn't do anything. Do it, doesn't it? it doesn't do any of those things. It just allows them to turn up and they've got a fit, you know, turn up at the right time, and come in and sign a bit of paper without actually giving them much help. Um, and I think you know we need to look at that. We need to look at our attitude of trying to enable people to get uh, to get back into work and all those kind of things. And it doesn't help. You know, it's, this is quite a, an emotive and a stressful um, period of your life. You know, if you uh, lose your job unexpectedly or you find yourself having to go into a food bank, people struggle with it mentally. And then at the very moment when you need someone to be helping you, giving you a bit of hope, we don't. We're not providing a system that does that. So I think that's what we need to look at. We need to be getting with the right attitude. And like other um, like people have said, not, not victimising people. We should, we should be giving them a hand and not using them as a scapegoat. And um, you know, not disproportionately um, um, cutting the people who are most vulnerable and most in need. Um, I think we need to really have a, a root and branch look at um, the thing that we prioritise when we're looking at these things and areas, if we are cutting, where we do it and um, just how we want to treat people in general. Thank you, good evening everybody. Um, I got an invite to the opening of the Snenton Food Bank in a week's time or two weeks time. Half of me is happy about that, that people are volunteering to operate in Snenton. Half of me is absolutely disgusted that we need, in the sixth richest country in the world, to have food banks. Disgusted that a million people are relying on them and many of those are in jobs that are either zero hours contracts so people can't rely on a regular wage or they're paid so low that they have to rely on that as well. So I think uh, it's, uh, our aim should be to get rid of food banks altogether because people have enough to live on without having to go to that. Uh, whilst there is this difficulty, whilst people are in these situations, it's great that people are operating food banks. Sanctions, I believe, is part of uh, a system that has been particularly cruel to the most vulnerable people in our society. I heard a story recently. Um, sorry, this is Eckridge. Is it better without the microphone? I heard a story recently about a, uh, a young man who was sanctioned because he was he'd have been told by the job centre to go for ten jobs in a month. He was a young man who was vulnerable. He had some mental health issues. He applied for nine, and so he was sanctioned for three months and told to do get 20 jobs. And he failed to get that target as well to apply for 20, he applied for something in the teens, and then he was sanctioned for six months. And then for two years, two years of stopping his benefit, what kind of country has anybody at that kind of situation? We need a big change in these things. Hello. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so my party, Tusk, uh, we believe that the main parties don't represent working class people or the poorest people. And um, the, the policy of, of austerity is an example of where uh, poor people, the poorest people, 99% are being made to pay. Um, so the, the recession and the crash was a, was a problem in the private sector, that's the market economy, the profit sector. It was a problem there. But we're being told that we have to cut the public sector and public services to bail the private sector out, although the private sector is still making massive profits. The top 1% um, people in the um, country, uh, their income is £450 billion. Pounds. The deficit is £80 billion. Pounds. So that could have paid off the deficit like seven times or more than that. 
But we don't hear that. Why have the Labour Party or the other parties not been saying, hang on a minute, what about this £450 billion? Pounds? You know, forget this £80 billion, let's just write it off. Why haven't we been hearing that? Because we think, you know, they are putting first the interests of the 1%. And so we decided to cap benefits, not because, you know, just because we haven't got the money, when it, clearly we have got the money, is wrong. And wouldn't it be great if, um, you know, it's one rule for the rich, one for the poor. If big business doesn't pay their tax, what happens to them? Oh, they get called in in front of a panel of MPs and given a ticking off. You know, wouldn't it be nice if that happened if you were on benefits? You know, you just got ticking off and then you could go off and, and do whatever. But uh, sanctions are completely wrong. The capping welfare is wrong. So welfare is our safety net. All of us who have to work to survive, if we haven't got a job, we need benefits. It's the working class safety net and trade unions and working class people have fought for it and we need to defend it. Um, yeah, sanctions from the W, sorry, DWB, food banks. Yeah, it's a lot of sense by, by all the candidates here. Um, you miss an appointment, you get sanctioned. You fail to meet your GSA agreement, you get sanctioned. And um, they kick people off the benefits for three or six months, as we've heard before. And what's interesting is the government then doesn't class the person as unemployed. So they come off the unemployment list. So it's, oh look at this, at any one time there's thousands of people being kicked off or sanctioned and it decreases their employment levels. When in fact those people are still there, um, they're there at the three banks for enough. Um, so we need to address that. Sanctions are a terrible thing, they need to be stopped. The welfare system is there as a safety net, but it's not there as a livelihood. What we've seen is we've seen a benefit class um, come about over the labour years um, and now we have people who actually live in benefits. Now I can tell you because I've been employed many times as a single parent, I've been caught up in the benefit trap. It's real. It is very real. And you're thinking, I want to work, but if I work, I lose out. Same thing with the bedroom tax. You know, you get penalised for the bedrooms and they say go get a lodger. So if you get a lodger and you have to declare that income, then you lose your benefits anyway. They really don't seem to care about people on the bottom. I'll just pick up one thing Antonio said. You mentioned Atos. I'm glad you did because Atos is an appalling contract that Labour signed. A 1.5 billion contract to Atos to assess people with ill health and, and disabled people to deem whether they're fit for work or not. When it should be, in fact, the doctors who deem them fit for work or not. Um, that needs to end as well. So yeah, safety net for the needy, not for a livelihood. So, is that on? Can you hear me yet? Yeah. Um, well, I don't think it'll take long to get an example of uh, the disconnect with politics. Um, we have a Labour gentleman next to me who couldn't wait to mention zero hour contracts. Yes, they are exploited. But these moral epiphanies that these guys seem to have is amazing when um, they think that history began in 2010. Zero hour contracts have been along well before then. In 1997, Tony Blair, in a speech to his conference, said they will ban zero-hour contracts. And here we are, recycling the same bad sound bites that pull the wool over your eyes, expecting them to talk the talk and walk the walk. We're, I just hope we don't fall for it again, for their faux outrage at these things, their faux concern that they're going to do something about it. That's why I'm standing, to challenge the nonsense of people like this, who just throw sound bites at you. Sorry, probably not you, more Chris Leslie, but he didn't bother to turn off. But, um, we've just got to challenge this concept. We've got to draw a line in the sand somewhere where we're going to fall for the same sound bites, same sound bites. That's why I'm standing. And I hope people are brave for their votes in this election, because if all we can aspire to is the same sound bites from the Tories and Labour and going back and forth, then that's really sad. First of all, something that Fran said about um, livelihoods. Um, most people that are on benefits are in fact working. We do not have um, we do not have a system where 
uh, people have a living wage, so we need a living wage, and that is a Green Party policy. Uh, we also need to recognise a lot of people that are working in paid work and doing unpaid work. That includes a lot of women working in the home, domestic work, voluntary work. And yes, they have benefits. They need them to survive. It is a job to bring up a child. It is a job to look and to do care work at home. Disproportionately affected of, by the cuts are women and young people. At the moment, there are more young people, shelter says, um, that are homeless than any other group, young people and families. In terms of things like the bedroom tax, Green Party are against that. In terms of be benefit caps, Green Party would remove that. In terms of things, I want to pick up on something that, um, that uh, Labour, our Labour representative has said. Um, 30 billion pounds more in cuts was voted in with only 18 18 MPs across the entire country voting against that, and that was in January. That was five, that included five Labour MPs, none of which came from Nottingham. So, in terms of where we think where the cuts are, we have uh, th 375 billion pounds were put into quantitative easing, and yet there are mi a million people that have needed to use food banks. Can we uh, speak on yeah. James first, and David. Yeah, I'm just. Firstly, I'm just going to add to, to what Seb was saying on zero hour contract. We hear a lot of, about zero hour contracts from the Labour Party, especially about how it's the end of the world, the end of the employment world. I don't know if they've actually looked at the statistics that are released by the Office of National Statistics, which said that of 30 million 900 thousand people in employment in the UK. 697,000 people are on a zero hours contract. That's 2.3% of the entire working population. And on average, these workers are working 25 hours a week. Can you please stop treating us like children? You know, throwing sound bites at us, saying, oh, it's an epidemic, we need to vote for Labour because Labour will sort it out. Nottingham East has 11% rate of unemployment. 11%. That's double the national average. That's double the average of the East Midlands. The highest, Nottingham North, 13.4%, Labour since 1987. Leicester East, 12.3%, Labour since 1987. Sherwood, Labour between 1992 and 2010, 12.2%, and then Nottingham East, which has been Labour since 1992. You can't keep saying to us, we need to vote for you. What have you been doing for Nottingham East and for, for the East Midlands for the last 15, 13, you know, however long you've been in power since 1997? It's ridiculous. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, no one's saying that zero hours contracts started in 2010, I didn't say that, but they have gone up exponentially, and I'm not throwing sound bites, I'm talking about people that I represent here in Stenton who are in that situation, I talked to somebody the other day, he's got a job, but in that job he was given two days work in 10. The other eight, he had to turn up for work and then sent home again. And then, of course, for those eight days, he could claim benefit, but he was overpaid, and then he had to pay some back. They mess up people's lives. There's always been casual work for people who want that kind of situation, students in bars, people working in the summer, out in the, uh, in the, in the agricultural industry. But that's not the same as being expected to turn up for work without any guarantee of it. That's not treating people with respect, that's not treating people with dignity, and we need to get rid of those exploitative zero hours contracts. Cathy first. So I'm going to make the last two It's good to hear that everyone is against sanctions and concerned about benefits, uh, but what is actually going to happen when or if they get into power? So all the main parties have committed to cuts, 30 billion cuts, uh, as Antonio said, Labour voted with the Conservatives for another £30 billion pounds of cuts. UKIP is saying £35 billion pounds of cuts. Um, you know, so it's all very well talking about it, but what's going to happen? Rachel Reid of the Labour Party said that the Labour Party would be tougher than the Tories on benefits. So we're getting two different messages here. Um, the way that the economy is set up is to make profits, it's not to create employment. So a, a, job, uh, a company will be kept running as long as it makes big profits, if it doesn't it will close down. So we 
believe in nationalising significant sectors of the um, of the economy so that we can control it and so that what would have been profits will be invested into it and create proper, decent jobs for people. We also support a £10 minimum wage now for all ages, not discriminating against young people and a cap on rents. So, um, um, we've gone away from the subject. Okay, but it's about, it's about training benefits and the cost of living. Yeah, thank you. You mentioned the Zimbabwe contract, now you mentioned it, I'll say it. Um, one of the biggest donors to the Labour Party actually used zero hours contracts. I've seen people go to work for six o'clock and didn't turn around because there's no work for them for that day. They give over a million pounds to the Labour Party. I'm not going to name them, but they do. Right, thank you. That's the second question we've got. Um, if anyone wants to make a comment on Twitter, uh, we're on hashtag Snenton15. So I'll go for it. So, third question. This is on Rob Harrison. Uh, it's on security and the internet. The internet is very important, and my livelihood and I feel knowledge and understanding how modern technology works is sorely lacking in Parliament. What are your opinions on mass internet surveillance? Do you believe that fight against terrorism should warrant the loss of our freedom as citizens? That's Gary first place. Thank you. Um, we have to have some sort of monitor of the internet because of what's happening. We have a national security, so we need some sort of monitor. But we don't want like a snooker's charter, definitely not. We need some. We need freedom as well. But we obviously, I've got a, an 11 year old son, and I want him to make sure he doesn't go on any, any adult sites accidentally. He wouldn't do it on purpose. If he, you know, like surf the internet, he likes to play Minecraft, you know, the games and everything, so he likes all that. So he does go on the internet and talk to his friends on the internet. But we need some sort of security there to make sure that my lad doesn't end up on an adult chat site. So we don't want a snooker's child, we want the freedom to be able to surf the internet, but we have to have a little bit of, of sort of protection from that. Um, yes, um, internet is, um, is important to everyone. Um, we have to look at um, safety, but um, I think, Gary, what you're talking about is parental controls, uh, which are sort of different from uh, uh, security looking at anybody's, uh, anybody's details from on high. Um, the intelligence around, it sometimes worries me an awful lot of, of things that are happening around uh, where intelligence comes from. You only have to look at what happened to Jean-Charles Menezes, who was um, shot dead um, and was mistaken. I mean, what, what kind, what, how, how does intelligence get, get gathered? If, if someone can't even be recognised, if, if where someone lives, the house that someone lives, um, and the colour of their skin is enough to condemn them. Uh, so we have to look at freedom of speech, and in fact freedom of speech is one of the issues that can help fight terrorism, because when there's a simmering pot of a whole lot of things that people can't say, people can't do, people can't, can't give voice to things, that is one of the ways in which, which issues of terrorism, where, where terrorism is, um, is born, really. Um, you have an issue where people feel isolated from, country, um, from the country that they're born in, the country that they live in, and we have to stop that. Community work and reaching out to groups and, and reaching out to people and actually realizing that we're part of one system of many different ethnicities and faiths is one of the ways, one of the ways in which we can deal with terrorism rather than the kind of big brother looking in and largely getting it wrong. I guess it's quite a difficult and uh, personal line to tread where you uh, draw the line between uh, like freedom and security and all the civil liberties kind of issues that go along with it. Um, I think that we, you know, we should be allowed to, you know, to an extent, like, do what I want, send a message to whoever I like, you know, on a wide spectrum of issues without, you know, without fear that someone is snooping 
or having a, a having a look at something. Um, what bothers me about this issue is I don't think we actually um, have a dialogue with us and each other and the uh, constituents and the public about it. I think this kind of gets steamrolled by established parties and the government telling us what is good for us, what we want, what we need, because you know because they have a vested interest in all these kind of things. And what they neglect to do on this issue and on so many other issues is actually have a conversation with us and reflect our interests. Now I'm sure we have a polarised opinion on where on where we draw that line between freedom and security, but we can't make a legitimate decision on stuff like this unless we have a conversation on it. And I don't see a will of them to do that. Um, and I suspect that my opinion will be massively different to a lot of people's opinion on, um, on here, where we draw the line about security, you know, needed messages of potential threat and all that. But the very least they could do is humour humor us with a dialogue of actually constructing something that reflects us on uh, what we think about it and not uh, mommy coddle and nanny status is telling us what's best for us when actually we really don't trust them to be able to do something with it. So I, I, I agree with the first bit of, of Seb's answer that actually it's a difficult issue because you're talking about protection and you're talking about privacy and sometimes those things seem to be mixed up. Yes, we need, I think as Gary said, to protect children and young people on the internet. We need to not have situations where young people can be groomed through contracts, through chat rooms and other things on the internet. We also don't want people to be, uh, particularly in school girls, to be encouraged to go off to, to Syria to fight through internet contact, that kind of stuff. On the other hand, I don't think we know enough about how the systems work and what actual information about us is stored and whether absolutely everything of that is, is necessary. So I do feel uncomfortable about the level is, you get those phone calls, don't you, where people try and sell you something, they tell you you've had an accident when you haven't had one uh, and say you've got a chance to claim or, or it's time for you to get your PPI on a loan that you've had. Uh, how do they know those things? I don't know that it's always government security. I think sometimes it's uh, insurance companies and others selling your information on, making money out of it. And I think we should be clamping down on those kind of things. But it's a difficult issue. I don't agree with Seb's last point that all politicians are just bolly coddling and coddling and don't talking to people. I spend a lot of my time talking to people in meetings like this in my surgery every Saturday, coming to community groups, walking around the streets of Stenton, because I believe that's my job. People don't always agree with everything that I say, uh, but people um, at least have a chance of getting access. They're all secret. The programs are all kept secret. They wouldn't, we wouldn't know about this, so we revealed them. What's that got to do with my walking around Stenton? Well, you're a councillor, not yeah. a candidate, sir, so... I, I am, yes. <laughs> Yeah, well, he's, he was there last Saturday. He, he, he was there last Saturday. He was there last Saturday. He will be there this Saturday. And if you're uh, on his email um, uh, tree, then he gives you a, a very detailed account of what he's done every week. How many surgeries? Details of what he does. That's what the whip tells me to do. I agree with what uh, Seb said. Um, we believe that um, these statement organisations should be more democratic. They can still be, um, you know, they don't have to be that everything is revealed and everything is public, but it, they need to be run in a democratic way. And, and often these, um, these laws are actually used to, against people uh, like activists. So there's various examples of, of where um, activists, like climate activists and so on, have, have been spied on by the police and such like. You know, and they're not a threat to, they're not terrorists, they're not, not going to be terrorists. Uh, so they do need to be uh, democratically controlled and, and, you know, democracy is partly about structures and so it's involving trade unions which are, which are democratically structured and community groups and so on which are, which are democratically structured and also making sure that they are run in a democratic way so that everyone has a voice because we, we can have an opinion on it, you know, we can... Um, we, we do know, you know, we're, we are people, we are working class people, we run society and we, we know how to do things.
Um, I'd just like to answer your question. How many, how many um, sessions does uh, Chris Leslie do here? Not easy to that one. And we learned that from the previous listings as well. Let me paint you a picture here. What info is stored about us? Um, all pictures, all data, all transactions, all photos, all calls, all texts, all emails, everything about you. They're not about, um, they're encouraging you to have smart meters at your home. And they will be recording what you turn on, when you do it, when you turn things off. They will know everything about you. And as the gentleman in the second row here pointed out, we would not know any of this if it wasn't for Edward Snowden coming out with it. So mass internet surveillance, does it warrant uh, a war on our privacy? But crime, we have to acknowledge that crime is evolving. So the, the policing needs to evolve alongside with it. Freedom of speech is paramount, it's part of our constitution. So there has to be a clear choice, I suppose, between freedom and our um, security. But with the rolling news channels, the 24-7, the news feeds, um, telling us about all these atrocious things which is happening all the way around the world and how it's going to directly affect us with our life, when in reality, it's only things which happen within our local community which really affects us. So it's the principle of our constitution that we have the freedom of speech. I'll leave you with this one little bit of a soundbite. You hear people say, well if you've got nothing to hear, then you've got nothing to hide, have you? Well that's not the point, is it? I think the first thing we need to do is actually acknowledge the fantastic work that our intelligence security services do to keep us safe on a daily basis because it's very easy to point out where things have gone wrong, but it's also very hard to point out when things have gone on behind the scenes that you and I have no idea about but we've been kept safe because of what our intelligence services do. This is the classic argument of individual liberty versus big government. I feel our, kind of, our friend on the end wants to take us back to the Soviet Union where everybody is told where they can go, how much they can earn what they can do for work, what their parents are going to do, etc, etc. I believe this is a big grey area. We need a system that's robust, that's safe. We need, if the security services, for whatever reason, and if they have a valid reason, believe that they need access to someone's records, or to certain, certain records that someone is keeping, that they, if they believe that there's a threat to the United Kingdom, that they can have access to it. These are things which, unfortunately, are not going to be in the public domain because as soon as you leak an information about a raid or about a potential warrant that goes out, you can blow up, you can blow the whole operation. I have to disagree with most people on on the Snowden point that people raise. I, it's good that we're talking about it, but the amount of intelligence capabilities that we've lost as a nation because of what has been released by Snowden has put us back many, many years in fighting terrorism, not only abroad but also at home. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, we certainly need, as I said, we need some sort of security there to make sure we're all looked after. We don't know what's going off in the world half the time. But there again, as I said, I, I don't want to see a snoopers child. I don't want everybody looking at what I'm. I know people do look at my emails, but you know, I don't want everybody, everybody, you know, security service looking at what I'm writing. And it's, it's what you mentioned earlier on um, about uh, selling our. Uh, details off to other companies, that does happen. I believe that the DVLA actually do that and actually take the box, so I'm not very happy about that. I'll ask one to the next question if we are running out. Yeah, just to say that we were compared to the Soviet Union, um, but the Soviet Union was not a democratic, was not democratically run, and they had a massive secret police uh, service, so we are for. Um, the services to be run democratically. Thank you. 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 We know that sex work is on the increase as a result of austerity and rising poverty. At the same time, arrests and raids of sex workers continue despite concern that criminalisation forces sex workers into danger and makes it harder to report violence. I've been dismayed to see that some MPs are focusing on increasing criminalisation by criminalising the clients of sex workers. I'd like to know where you stand on this issue. This person cannot vote for any kind of day that is not ready to be serious consideration. To the decriminalisation of sex work, i.e., like the one in New Zealand, the Prostitute Reform Act. 
Your views, please. Uh, Antonia? Okay, and um, there's um, a number of different aspects here. First of all, there's the aspect that women are indeed um, disproportionately affected by austerity. And that's a massive issue in itself. Um, the Fawcett Society says about 80% of the cuts so far have come out of women's pockets. That needs to change. So we are, in fact, the only party um, that's had somebody in Parliament that is against austerity, that is standing against austerity. Um, so that's one aspect. So um, women wouldn't have to go into areas of work that they don't want to. I'm not saying that, um, that all sex workers um, go in, people go into um, sex work for any number of reasons. In terms of decriminalising, um, in terms of decriminalising it, it is something that um, the Green Party have, uh, have looked at. We definitely need to stop criminalising the women concerned uh, because it, it isn't... The crime is when people can't afford to live. We also need to look at the other issues attached, linking to health problems and linking to um, an awful lot of sex workers are raped, and sex workers can be raped. Um, dealing with things to do with women's services, they're the first to go. And um, in, in cuts, I was I was a women's worker, and the, and and the cuts meant that 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 work dried up. So we need to look at different ways to support women, um, and that that includes sex workers. Um, so yes, there's there's a lot of different aspects, including one of the things that we want to do is ring fence uh, money for women's shelters and women's services and that, that's, a, that's a really important aspect so that people don't end up having to make choices that they then get looked at and criminalised for because if it gets driven underground women are in even more danger and, and the dangers are immense including as I say things like rape and even murder and these are hardly ever reported. Thank you. So, I think there's uh, two aspects to this. Um, a bit like the previous question, the first bit I would say is about like coercion. So it probably comes down to uh, civil liberties again. If, uh, if there's no aspect of coercion um, for someone to partake in the sex industry, whether that is social, economic or like physical force, then that comes down to the dialogue of how we feel what someone can actually do with their body. If they choose to do that with their body, then you know, what is the question is who are we to intervene with, with someone who is of, uh, wants to do that? Um, so in that case, then we need to have that discussion about decriminalising in that case, if we feel that the state should or should not have an opinion on someone who can make that sound judgement. Um, the other aspect is when there's something of coercion that forces someone into that, I guess. You know, whether it be social economic, that uh, someone feels desperate enough or you know, feels the need to go down that avenue, then shame on us for, for not maintaining our economy or not providing the, the opportunities or environment for someone to you know, not feel that they have to, uh, to go down that avenue where they, where they are exploited. Um, anyone being exploited in every, anything is bad. Um, whether decriminalising it is the, the, the issue for that, um, I don't think it... Does it, does it really matter? We, whether it's illegal or not, we need to really support people who find themselves in that position. Um, look, I, it probably is uh, it's probably illegal at the moment to, uh, because it's something the parties are too scared to talk about because you know they'll lose sway um, mass, mass parts of their vote um, in crucial elections and they solely exist on from election to election so we don't get a dialogue on about it. As an independent, I can be brave enough to talk about it. If we need the feel the need to decriminalise it, and we can throw drugs into there as well, um, decriminalise it, um, um, to progress how we deal with it better, then let's do it. We don't need to just um, submit to an archaic viewpoint just because it secures us a win at the next election. 
So I'm not certain that there's a, a line in our manifesto about this issue because I think it's uh, very uh, interesting and one that needs further discussion. I agree with quite a lot of what's been said. Uh, whereas obviously people, women, uh, should be free to do what they want with their body. And men, yes, that's true. But in the past, our history has been uh, littered with men taking services from women and men, and it's been the, the people offering the services have been criminalised rather than those who are taking them and they've got away with it uh, in, a, in a way which is exploitative. And we need to have protection for women and men's health in these situations, for their safety, uh, for some, some kind of solidarity. Uh, people have talked about um, cooperatives in this area where women can be supportive of each other and be sure that they're not being exploited by those who are having those services. But I think there's a lot to be discussed about this. Um, I would want to give a try and answer. I think I'm, I'm happy to discuss it further. My name is Daniela Swatis, and I run a charity that supports sex workers. I'm going to be in control of this, and we just push it under the carpet. Please, whoever wins it, come and see me. We'll see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, we haven't got a policy about this in our manifesto. Um, but what is, there's two things. One is prevention, um, and one is, you know, keeping women safe. <coughs> and um, austerity has affected women um, relatively. And, um, you know, looking after women, looking after working class people, making sure that they get enough to live off is, is what can prevent that. But also, there is the, there is the way that um, women are exploited in society, so there's masses and masses of profit made from the beautification industry, you know, which pushes certain images of women uh, forward, certain size, certain colour, and so on. And, um, you know, women are made to feel bad if they don't look a certain way, and massive amounts of money are made in that. Also, um, young people are being, becoming addicted to pornography. Um, and so we do um, advocate uh, appropriately for the age, but sex education for young people in schools, which is teaching not just about sex, but about relationships and respect, and how to look after your your body and keep your own space and so on. Yeah. Yeah, the decriminalisation of um, sex workers. The, uh, we haven't got a policy in this in the manifesto, but as with most things, we, we tend to use a little bit of common sense. It is the world's oldest profession. It's been around for time. So it's not going to go away anytime soon. So why are we all criminalising? this uh, industry because it's going to be there no matter what we do. So we should be able to debate this issue. Let's have a look. Let's have a look at elsewhere in the world what's worked for other countries because some countries actually have a very good um, sex working industry where they actually work with the workers in the sex industry and there's considerably less problems. Less problems with crime, less problems with drugs and people trafficking. Um, making a safe environment for sex workers. So these issues have been resolved elsewhere, and perhaps we need to look elsewhere. There is an argument for the legalisation, um, but the current criminalisation of sex workers, as it is, isn't going to work, and there's no, um, there's nothing in the pipeline for it to change, so I'd welcome the change. But I'll leave, leave you uh, with this, what else is happening um, with the EU, because the EU now instructs all of its member states to include um, the black market economies from the sex industry and from uh, the drug industries as well. And they have to add what they think has been spent in those areas to the national economy. So when they say the economic uh, success of this country has grown in past years, it's because they're actually having a guess of how much money people are spending in the sex industry and on the illegal black, uh, black market of drugs. So uh, when you say uh, we've had an economic boom over the past few years, I wonder where it's come from. <laughs> Daniela, thank you uh, actually for bringing this up because without, I think without forums like this, you wouldn't really have the chance to put questions to the candidates and have a big discussion about it. I'm going to hold my hand up and say I'm not an expert. I wish I could give you a yes or no answer, whatever you're looking for. Um, 
the point I can make about decriminalisation, this is only what I'm, the thought that I'm throwing out there, is that it, it would turn it more into an industry, not to say that people aren't trafficked already for sex work around Europe and around the world, but I, one of my fears is that if you turn it into decriminalise it, and as we say in certain places, I think in Germany as well, it's regulated by the state. I don't know if that will make it, the trafficking of people worse, a worse problem than we have at the, at the moment. I mean, I'm more, I'd be more than happy if you could drop me an email to look into this or to even you know, come and talk to you and have a discussion about it because, like you say, this is not something that we hear about every day, but it doesn't, make, doesn't mean that that's not an important issue that we should be, you know, it's someone's, people's lives at the end of the day. It's the things we're trying to, we're trying to make better, so thank you for raising it anyway. Thank you. I, I don't know what the Tory policy is on it at all. What I do know is that we need to... I don't know. No, no. I'll be honest with you. They have actually gone on his politician. <laughs> but what I do know is that people who enter the sex industry, for whatever reason, we do need to give them respect. They are people at the end of the day, and they're trying to make a living one way or the other. The people who I don't like are the people traffickers. They need to be stamped out as soon as possible. And the other thing that I would like to do, what I'd like to see, is that people who do work in the sex industry, if they can have some sort of regular check-up, and, and, and it doesn't have to cost, you know, if, you know, and that way it sort of, it, it protects the person who's working in that industry and the clients as well. But we do need to treat the people who work in the sex industry, for whatever reason, with respect. And tell me first, then, so. Um, just a couple of points that um, I want to come back on. Um, Seb um, was talking about uh, the way in which uh, policies are made and uh, the way in which uh, the way in which people nothing happens in Parliament because the people at the top don't want change. Our policies in the Green Party. Um, sorry if I, I said that slightly wrong. But, um, our policies in the Green Party are made and voted for by our members, and that's 70,000 now because we've we've uh, quadrupled in number, and we don't have a party whip. So, in terms of, and we also believe in the right to recall. So, in terms of being held accountable and having many, many voices, we also have more women in our party than we have men. Um, so that's one thing. In terms of something that Cathy said about sex and relationship education, I totally agree. And in fact, Caroline Lucas is putting a bill through Parliament now about that, so that um, we're looking at um, uh, age, age appropriate sex and relationship education from school onwards. In fact, it was also part of Nottingham Students. Stu Nottingham Students Manifesto as well. In terms of the EU, um, things that, um, that Fran has said, I, 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 I honestly don't know where you get some of this from. I will say that, I, I, I will say that uh, work um, with EU countries um, against sex trafficking is a massive thing and that takes EU cooperation. So. Uh, I think the guys on the panel kind of uh, gave a lot of substance to your uh, point really. Not in our manifesto, not in our manifesto, not in our manifesto and doesn't dare give his own personal opinion because it might be in conflict with the legal opinion. This is the disconnect with politics. They don't care about the issues that you care about. We need to be brave and stop fueling this perpetual nonsense and get something that is actually reflective of the stuff we care about. We keep doing the same thing over and over again. Him, him, her, her, them, them. We want to know what you think, not what that person done, this person done, the other person done. And we don't want to know what's happened in the past. We already know that. We want to know what you're going to do about the future. I will leave this to later, please. We might have a chance if we get the questions to Well, that wasn't a question, that was an observation, because I'm sitting here and I'm going to because I'm fed up with hearing about this person going back to this and stuff, rather than what you personally think. I'm just glad for you, to be honest. Well, I'm happy to talk about it, give me the mic, but I'll answer that question. You're to talk about it, you gave me flat.
panel and point of view. I'm trying to promote the dialogue. These guys don't want to have a dialogue. I want you to talk to me and shape the direction that we move. These guys don't want you to have a part in the direction that we move forward. I, that's what I want you to do. I just want to facilitate you directing the movement, the, the direction we take. These guys have are rubbing a stamp on the agenda. They, 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 I want to have these guys, <laughs> these guys, I've worked with Dave Mellon now for 10, 15 years on the Bentley Clinic from We've what worked together closely. I've worked with Chris Leslie. I'm in constant contact with Chris Leslie. He has sorted out some problems. So you know why he's been working on shit with him? I don't know where he is now. That's not up to me. He has a diagnosis. Can we? We've got 10 minutes at the end. If we're lucky, can we? Can we walk with him? Can we ask his questions later, please? Right. Uh, just want to say something about um, you know the people at the top um, not being interested and. Um, I, I want to say that if we want to, if we want change, we've got to fight for change because the people at the top aren't going to give up that power um, easily, and it's not going to be easy to to fight for change. The Greens uh, had minority rule in Brighton, but um, they still passed through some cuts, even though they were anti-austerity, and that's the pressure that we're under. And we, at Tusk, we understand that that we have to fight. We have to fight because the voluntary sector, which, um, which, which supports power, has been cut massively. And if every um, Labour council in the country had refused to pass on those cuts and stood and faced up to the Tory bullies, then those cuts could not have happened. So it is about action, it is about what's happened in the past, and it is about what people are prepared to do. So Tusk councillors will not pass on the cuts, and we will campaign and fight and take action to stop question. those cuts. Kathy, yeah, this was just because you want to spoke one Right, before we finish on that question, um, Danielle, what, what, what was the question? Danielle, yeah. sex workers, was you happy with that? What you got? Quite respectfully, yeah, but always like four women were raped, one we had four convictions in the last two years. That's because we've all worked together with the police values in probation. We've had to five. Sex workers do report offences. And I think that's what we have to do is to get to a point where we're not relying on government so much, just try and sort out. We need them to be able to support local grassroots community initiatives and not leave so much of our lives to be planned and controlled by government. Because you're going to get the same, you're to, if people are going into politics or going to be in a ministry, they're going to give you the same answer, the same thing, over and over again. Okay, the last couple, well, we might have a chance for one more question. It's, it's the question is about the role of an MP. As an MP, it's about the candidate's role to represent the views of the constituents. What will members of the panel do to measure the opinions of their constituents before voting on issues? What do members of the panel do to improve their own accountability? when the way they vote does not match the views of their constituents. And I think it's set first. I guess that ties in a lot with the point you were trying to make. Um, if we, on the other hostage, we'd have a two or three minute intro where we've been able to outline exactly how we want to do things. And the whole point I want to, what I'm trying to stand on, is to, to, to do and create something that is exactly that, reflective of people's wishes and desires. So, you know, to answer that point and this wider question, you know, what I've been doing this whole campaign is letting interaction with people shape everything I've put out there. Everything that I've put on my website has been through conversations with people like you. It's been through the thousands and thousands of emails that we've all had through this campaign, answering them and letting them shape exactly the agenda and uh, the, the way that we're going to try and do this. You know, what I see this role to be is facilitating, you know, facilitating your hand on, legis on the legislative process, to get your voice in Parliament to shape that legislative process. So all I will do is continue to do that, try and get as much exposure as I can, talk to as many people as I can, and encourage people to come and speak to me. I would hold, you know, I would be someone embedded in our community, you know, who's lived here all his life, you know, that, that actually has a stake in this community, and uh, reflect that in Parliament, and make sure that's, that is the message, and that is the voice that's being heard in Parliament, and not something else, and not the best of interest of the party, the party of me. Thank you. David? So, I think uh, there's, there's further work to be done in this area, and I think 
for people to feel confidence in politicians that is so clearly lacking amongst a good chunk of people on the doorsteps. There is work to be done and I think uh, it's all, all very well being in meetings, it's all very well answering emails, although that's really important, but you've got to get into a community and understand how it works, walk around it, volunteer in it. I've um, been on the Managing Committee Bates for for 20 years now and it's not a very glamorous job, it's about getting a, 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 a building that's welcoming to all races, uh, it's clean, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, safe, it's warm, but actually you see all sorts of different people come through that building, some of whom are very confident, got their lives together, some people are very needy. Having a surgery is really important, having people access to get access to you, we've got different ways of doing that nowadays, email, Twitter, Facebook, all those things come into it. Uh, but it's also about walking around the area, just seeing what the issues are, and being prepared not just to come around election time, but other times, like a drafty January uh, evening, when actually there might be only four people at the meeting, that, those four people still matter, uh, and they have a validity and a, a chance to, uh, they should, their views should be heard and then responded to. It's not an easy job being a representative, I don't think, uh, but I think we have got still bridges to mend uh, from the, the difficulties of the MPs, expenses uh, scandal in particular, of the of the late noughties. Thank you. Uh, Alex Hall, Tory Council. All um, Tusk MPs will take the average worker's wage. Uh, politicians voted, despite austerity, politicians voted themselves an 8% pay increase last year and they're uh, planning a 9% increase this year. But we don't accept that. We take the average worker's wage so that you know, it's clear that we, our interests are the same as working class people's interests. Um, also, we don't accept money from big business. So all the other parties uh, accept, not the independents, I don't know about them, um, accept money from... Don't you? I thought you... Um... Well, there's one. Yeah. Uh, there's one which is the, uh, the eco-energy. Right, OK, there's one. Yeah. But any anyway, so we, um, we do have a policy that we don't accept that. Um, and um, even, you know, as if, 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 if we're in the minority as MPs, we see our job as exposing what is going on in Parliament at the moment. As I said, you know, we're told that we need austerity, we're told that we need another 30 billion cuts, um, but the top 1,000 people have uh, earned 400 and, what was it, 50 billion pounds a year, and that has doubled during austerity, that has doubled. And the, the Can we get to what you would do personally? Oh right, yeah. Okay. Well I would I would stand up and expose that. I would keep going on about it actually and I would keep going on about how the government managed to find three hundred and seventy five billion to pump into the financial sector for quantitative easing. That went into the pockets of the financial sector and the big bankers. So you know even if there's only uh, a couple of our MPs, we will keep exposing what's going on and we will fight uh, because we need to fight against big business. There will be a huge lobby and huge think. pressure, but we will get uh, stereotyped and attacked, but we will continue to fight and gather people around us. Thank you. I, I, I think the reason why you didn't get an answer there is because they're going to tell you what to think, being socialists in general. Telling you what to think. It's, well, you can go and you can go and spend time in Cuba or the Soviet Union. I don't remember anybody trying to get over. The, I don't remember anyone trying to get over the, the Berlin Wall to East Germany. But you can probably fault me if I'm wrong there. Um, the big issue I'm going to well, one of the big issues I've had as an independent is trying to go door to door, try to canvass opinion, try to find out what people are thinking. Because one of the things that I want to do, like I said, was talking about, is to try and represent people's views. I mean, I've received. Say, for example, in the past few days, a lot of emails on big media interests, and I received 80 emails saying the same thing about the media controls too much of, of our, um, well, certain media barons control too much of our, of our print and, and media press. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I've received 80 emails, that's a lot of people who've taken time out to email me, that must be a really important thing, you know, in, the, in Nottingham East. But then I thought to myself, there are six, you know, 60 or thousand other electors who have an opinion. I think the big, what we need to do and what I would do is to try and make sure that people can access me or I have a bigger enough profile so that people 
whatever means they want to, to, to ask me questions on or to canvas me on, whether that be Twitter, to try and engage with, with the younger generation, whether that's emails, whether that's by holding the basic thing that an MP should, which is MP surgeries. I still, I still can't go over that we don't have surgeries from our, from our incumbent MP. So the first thing I'm going to do is introduce back, back to weekly surgeries, one a week throughout the year, and have 12 MP question times a year, so once a month, so that people can actually come on a weekly basis to say what, they, what their opinions are, and I can use that in formulating my view in Parliament. To improve accountability, if I do take an action or I vote in a certain way, I'll set that out in writing, in a public meeting, through social media, through Twitter, I'll say, this is the re I voted this way, these are the reasons that have informed my opinion on it, whether it's been informed from people I sp I've, I've spoken to, or whether it's something that I believe is in the general interest of all the residents of Nottingham East and the United Kingdom. So I'm vote by vote, whatever I voted, I'm going to tell you guys why I voted that way. Well, <laughs> in Nottingham East, well, I, it was great to be back in Nottingham East. Uh, I was born here in the seventies when my family came over here from Sardinia. So um, I've I've lived it and I've breathed Nottingham East. Um, just lost in road just up there actually. Um, and as a UK candidate, you know, I'm only here because we've been subjected to failure. You know, UKIP hasn't appeared out of thin air, it's manifested over a period of time because we've been let down time after time. And we have to look at it, why? Well, we can look at it, you know, the Labour Council, the City Council, the County Council, District Councils, Police Crime Commissioner who's closing police stations, and all Nottingham City MPs or all, M or all Labour MPs, and we wonder why things aren't working. So what is the role of the MPs? I mean, I was shocked, actually, um, James brought up something important. Um, that he said that Chris Leslie didn't do any weekly surgeries, um, and th that completely boggles the mind. So yes, I mean I I'll have weekly surgeries, um, regular meetings, get in touch with community groups. But the, the important thing about the UKIP MP is is that we're not whipped like the other parties. You know we are free to do what we want as long as we commit to the manifesto. So anything else which comes up, we have to. We have to go by what the constituents say. And that's also um, when it comes to local elections and the councillors. There is no whip system for lo local UK councillors. They have to go with the majority of uh, people's consensus in the wards. That's it. Thank you. Um, yeah, definitely surgeries, but what I would do, I'd have street surgeries, so rather than you guys coming to me, I'm going to go to you. What I would do every week, I'd come down the street, put a leaflet through your door, on Friday or Saturday or whenever, I'll be walking down your street, if you want me, you put a slip, you put your, your sheet of paper in your window, and I'll knock on your door. And that's what I, that's what I do as a local councillor anyway. I'm at a council of a, of a, a big uh, council estate, when the um, council wanted to close the um, community centre as a polling station, I fought that, I really fought that against my own party, and I got £157,000 refurbishment because the people on that estate wanted that as a polling station. And I'm very proud of that because I am those people. So it's people first, and then you, you, you group it second, and that's what I'm from. I'm a working bloke, I get up at half past three every morning, I travel 50 miles, go to work, do a shift and come back. So I know, I know what it's like. So yeah, people first and then the party second. Thank you. Antonio? Okay, um, hi. Um, I've mentioned a couple of things uh, before um, linking to something that Seb said earlier. Uh, the way that one of the first things I want to say is that I'm actually not that important. Uh, we believe in voting for policies, not people. Our policies are not, unlike other parties created at the top by a minority of people, they are created by now 70,000 people, 70,000 strong. And on vote for policies, they come up as the most popular. Um, so we believe in a right to recall. We do not have a party whip. We, uh, the, 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 uh, the right to recall means that it's a job like any other. If we got, one of us gets in and we're not doing the job, you can sack us. That's, that's a, that's, but it's, a, it's our policy. Um, 
That's, that's very important. The views of the constituents, I've lived in Nottingham East for 14 years. I'm part of various different groups and I would continue to work with more groups uh, because I believe that actually grassroots stuff is very important and we need to plug into that and into more of the localism. I receive hundreds of emails a day. I try to answer all of them and I do that myself. We don't have secretaries. Um, our policies are popular because they're made by real people, lots of young people, lots of uh, a large section of society. The way in which the way in which Caroline Lucas works as an MP is for me a model. We've had one Green MP, and she's done amazingly well because she's worked across the house across the different parties to get certain things done, whether that's the NHS reinstatement bill, because we are the only party that's been in Parliament that's standing against the privatisation of the NHS, um, which is losing uh, 18 million a day, 18 million a day into private companies, whether it's looking at the sex um, and relationship education bill, whether it's standing against uh, TTIP, whether it's standing against fracking, all sorts of different things. She's been a lone voice of reason and, and also looking at, at, at uh, reviewing um, drugs law. All of these things, this one woman standing on her own in Parliament with a party behind her with all of these policies made by real people. That is how I model how politics should be, working together so it's not just a shouting match, being um, being held accountable both by all of the um, party members and by all constituents so that either can actually pull you down if you're not doing the job and not having a party whip. Um, surgeries, groups, um, coming to things that you're invited to. I've been uh, uh, doing a lot of stuff with um, different groups like the women's hustings, like, groups. sorry, like the women's hustings, like BME groups, so building different, building communities, building, building the base of, of the groups of people that we work with has been part of this campaign and whatever happens in the election, I will want to keep that going. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I'm going to open the floor for five minutes, I'm sorry that's all the time we've got. So you first. So that was the last question. I'm sorry that this letter from you to stand up. Because yeah. it really is. I want him to answer this. If, if he is elected as the MP for this constituency, and later on, he will be in the government. So he will be on the government policy. He will not be able to no. So I want, I want to know, how is he going to properly represent his constituents? He is, he is going to be tied to the government all of the time. Anyway, exactly. And the treasury. So why is it in our interest to have an MP in the government? You can either have You either have a situation where uh, people are not whipped and therefore there is chaos because no one uh, 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 no, nobody can uh, the people who elected people on a manifesto, but if they don't have to stick to it, uh, then they're not going to do that, then you have got no measure of, of what, what you think they're going to be doing. Or you elect uh, somebody who's representative of the people, but standing under a party ticket, and you look at the manifesto as to what they are going to stand for. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't represent the people who, who you are, uh, who elect you, because often the issues that they are raising with you are individual issues, individual problems that you're sorting out, not great big policy issues on which the, the level is, is clear. So you can be a party of, a member of a party, and represent an individual people, and Chris has done that for the last five years. Children who are unable to read and write and fit into society. What are you going to do about improving our educational standards so that they're no longer a laughing joke abroad? 
I was, uh, I was speaking to a teacher yesterday and uh, um, she, she was just coming up to retirement and uh, she was quite torn whether to go, um, whether she was happy she was retiring or whether she was sad. Um, and the sentiments that came out is that um, she felt that our, uh, our education system was kind of trying to produce gym, uh, drones rather than like trying to um, make people thrive and make people flourish. Um, I, and then I think back to my own education and, and I think there was a few standout teachers along the way that were really inspiring and really made me interested in the subject or, you know, I thought their credibility and their principles were quite inspiring. I think that's what we should be, we should be doing that. We should be allowing teachers or, and the individuals who are teachers to be themselves, to be able to thrive and to, to be that inspiration to our children. You know, the feedback that we get, the feedback that I get is that, I get, is that all too often, the, there's too many stresses of exam to exam to exam, or um, you know, deadline, deadline, deadline. You know, these people are so tired, so stressed out that they don't um, they don't get an opportunity to thrive or be themselves and be inspiring. Um, furthermore, I think that argument can be spread to like to, to midwives, to nurses, or all these kind of things. Well, I would not disagree with that. Um, and, and so it comes down to attitudes, and it. Um, you know, it's about removing red tape and it's about being, you know, being brave enough to make sure that we put pressure on these people to say, you know what, you don't know, always know the answers. Let's teachers have this, you know, let's teachers use their uh, knowledge, you know, to, to say this is what best for teach. Yes, there you go. And doctors, they're probably experts in health too. Maybe we should say, we should maybe say, they're probably the best to uh, drive forward how we go for it. So it's probably an attitude that, um, it's an attitude that, um, People up here don't actually, you know, or whoever, whatever constituency, we don't know all the answers. We're not, you know, we don't have all the information, we don't have all the knowledge, and we should just allow people, to, you know, to be excellent and to give them an opportunity to grow. Thanks, Will. I've been a primary school teacher for 20 years and head teacher in the city. Um, and I think there's been too much distraction in the last five years. Schools have been worried about whether they should become an academy or not to become an academy. We've been a lot of money put into free schools, opening schools here in Nottingham that are not needed uh, because that's the policy of Michael Gove and, and the Tory policy. Um, and, and sadly, actually, maybe we've got children in classes over 30 again. Uh, I think there's 90,000 children in, in, in Key Stage 1 learning in classes over 30 when we got that down to 30 or below before and we've got many unqualified teachers as well. I don't think you'd go to an unqualified doctor to assess your health or an unqualified mechanic to mend your car. Uh, we shouldn't have unqualified teachers to do an important job. Only the competent people will have got people that can look after. 
after them and could represent them. So you need to be able to empower the people like us that are here, that have the confidence to tackle certain policies that you're coming up with that can help the people that are vulnerable, that are needed. <coughs> Um, what was the question? <laughs> Thank you. Um, education. education. Yeah. Um, well, education is about um, enabling people to think, empowering people, and um, you know, providing people with the skills and knowledge they need to contribute positively to society. And um, we we had we have. A, a state school system uh, which is set up to, to create accountability um, so that it is people who we've elected who are responsible for it and they're the ones who need to listen and to be held accountable. But the, the um, academy programme, you know, academies are not accountable in the same way. And academies were introduced by the Labour Party and, um, you know, escalated by the Conservatives and we, we believe they undermine state education, they undermine the terms and conditions of teachers because they can um, use unqualified teachers. And we do, we support um, the National Union of, of Teachers, you know, we have a relationship uh, with the union and with people from the union. And we also support um, students, you know, the, the notion of student unions and school student unions because we do need to have a dialogue. Um, we, we, you know, we do need to have a dialogue and listen to people and empower people to speak and enable them to um, have a voice. Um, the, you know, everything being geared towards exams and passing off, Ofsted tests is just a massive pressure on young people. Young people are under much more pressure than I was when I went to school and you can't learn properly. Um, you can't, you know, think well when you're under pressure. You can just sort of learn facts and figures to um, regurgitate. So, um, you know, we believe in this, the state school system that we should support that. We should nurture teachers and um, appreciate them for what they do and, and encourage them to um, develop ways of learning. And we should also empower students, you know, to have a dialogue with teachers to um, get what they can out of schools. And so, Hi, um, in fact our policies are very, very similar um, to tasks and um, someone from um, the National Union of Teachers came up to us when we were um, leafleting the other day and asked for a load of them for a mail out. Uh, before I answer the question I want to, I want to just say something to you. Um, I, I like what you said and I think there's an awful lot that needs that, that that needs to be addressed there. Unfortunately, we're all talking in terms of um, limited time. And um, one of the reasons I keep talking about policies is because um, it's not just my voice. My, uh, the policies of my party are created by a whole load of different people, which I'm very proud of. Um, and it also means that you know if um, one of us gets in what we're going, how we're going to vote, which I think is kind of important. Um, but we do need to talk more to different communities. That is something that I'm interested in in developing and, and something that we are all trying to do. Caroline Lucas won a Patchwork Foundation Award for doing just that in her constituency. Um, back to the question. Um, the marketisation of um, education uh, means that um, I'm going to disagree with you to some extent. I've got a lot of friends that are teachers and family that are teachers and class sizes are getting bigger. Um, teachers, they're, they're, a lot, they're being asked to do more with less resources on less pay. There are league ta tables which don't really, instead of helping the schools which have the least, they just get sold off into academies. Um, and league tables often are, are a result of other factors that are happening around, um, uh, other factors that are happening around a school. Like if, if a school is in an area of, of 
of immense poverty. If it, I, I have um, friends that are teachers that um, the parents come in and the children are on food banks and they can't afford clothes. Those sort of things, how can a child learn? So, re um, removing, the, uh, removing the market from education is important, uh, which would save an awful lot of money. Uh, and taking, um, bringing free schools and bringing academies back into an accountable public system, a more flexible, yeah, a more thank you, a more flexible curriculum, uh, more teachers, and more respect for teachers. Everything you hear is if there's a problem with education, it's it's the teacher's fault. You have a problem with one of the reasons why we have unqualified teachers is because there is a problem with uh, with, with retention for teachers and who can blame them with the problems that are happening. They're being asked to do the impossible with very, very little and given very little respect. Uh, we also believe that um, Ofsted should be replaced with more local authority um, regulation. Um, more local authority regulation that includes people and people's feedback, going back to what you were talking about. And that um, children's education shouldn't be a market. We believe in free education. And that means that the, it's not bad to make money. Um, small, we, we want to support, for example, small and medium-sized businesses. However, it is bad to make money in areas where you're making money out of uh, Removing so removing resources from education or from house care. So there's an awful lot more that I can say, but I can see our chair getting antsy, so I'm going to leave it there. But apart from one thing that comes from a teacher, not from me, who said it's like crowd management. How can we teach when all we are able to do is crowd manage? Thank you very much indeed. Well, that's all the day there. I want you to give all our delegates. Do you want one, one minute yeah. each? Just right, one minute. Okay, we'll thank, you, thank you for bringing it up. Um, I actually grew up in Lagos, Nigeria, and I've been back there the past few years, and I've seen actually that some of the maths and English that the kids are doing at a young age are far more advanced than what our kids are doing here. Um, one of the things that we need to know is this is that we're living in a global economy, and we need to educate children so that they can assimilate into that global economy once they come out of school. One of the big things that we need to do is to teach kids and train kids with the skills that business need when they're coming out of school. We have a large rate problem with unemployment. We have a lot of businesses saying that we would like to hire people, but they don't have the same the skills that we need. So we need to improve the links between schools and businesses so that kids are coming out with the skills that businesses want and need, and we'll need to compete in a global economy because we're not just competing with people down the street from us anymore. We're competing with people from China, we're competing with people from Nigeria, from the United States and Canada, which is true. And to go on, to say just very quickly on um, one of the things that we need to do, like you were saying, is to try and remove the government, you know, relying on, relying on red tape and government. My, my cousin is a teacher, she's a teacher in the academy, she just got promoted to deputy head the other week to sing her praises. But I asked her, what's the biggest issue you have? She says it's red tape. Government's telling me I have to hire this person. Government's telling me I need to, I need to do this paperwork. I need to do this piece of paperwork. We don't, we believe, so many people in government believe that they need to tell everybody in their life how to do, what to run. We need to leave schools to teachers to be able to teach. And it's this, it's, um, it's this freedom of choice. We should allow parents to choose where they want to send their kids to and allow teachers to have the resources to teach and to not be told and to have so much red tape that they need to employ a certain person, etc., etc. So I'm for freedom of choice and improving the link between schools and businesses so that we can graduate kids ready for the global economy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I mirror what you said, absolutely. But just bringing it more down to local level. I think that my, my dad was a school teacher and he was a lady counsellor as well. Um, but uh, yeah. um, what happened? I saw the light. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. but what, and I, so I know how hard teachers work, so I've had first hand experience. Now my son is nearly special needs, he's a, he's a little devil, and I have to push him every night to make sure he does his homework. I ain't going to blame the teacher if he's not doing his homework, it's mine, my fault if he doesn't do it, because that's a parental responsibility. So I'd like to see parents supporting the teachers. The other day my lad came home complaining that he had his sunglasses taken off him in class. 
Like, well, why was that then? I wasn't to blame the teacher. And he found out he'd been messing about with him. Well, fair play to the teacher, you know. If he's going to mess about in class, that's his punishment. But I think parents need to support teachers more, and, and that's, that's my philosophy. Just to echo these two gentlemen's uh, comments. Um, yeah, it's, it's shocking that some kids actually come out from, from school uh, and they can't read. It's, it's, it's shocking. But three words, we've heard them before in 1997. Education, education, education. Well, what happened? <laughs> yeah, do this one the right. Um, I'm a single parent and my child, uh, we've had problems. I've had problems. Um, I've gone to these parents' evenings and I've gone through, you know, you look at the um, the work being marked, and I noticed, well, they've got lots of ticks, that's good. But then when I scrutinise the answers, well, they're wrong, but they've been ticked right. So when I spoke to the teacher, I said, what's happened? You're ticking it, is it right, but it's not. And she said, I'm sorry, but I was up to four o'clock this morning, I've got a stack of paperwork. You mentioned red tape, it's ridiculous. Teachers don't go to teach profession wanting to fail kids, they go to it because they actually care about our kids. And what we need is great integration between parents and teachers cooperating together. Because what I found in my school is when parents and the teachers spend a little bit more time together to identify children's individual needs, uh, wonders can be done. But the other thing we need to recognise is that kids are all different. They generally have three ways of um, taking information in, audio, visual and kinesthetic. And what we would like to see is some education based on kinesthetic, so that's vocational qualifications. Because some kids just aren't academic, but hey, they're very, very clever. I had a friend at school, he couldn't read or write hardly, but he could strip an engine and put it back together. So let's look after these kids who are getting left behind as well. But yeah, teachers should be in charge of education, not government. <laughs> in general and actually it's a means of control um, and you know that fear does create create control and you know it's, it's creating the dissipating of our supposedly free media as it stands. I mean in Australia when there was a recent terrorist attack um, actually of the Australian government talks a lot about freedom of speech but huge bills were pushed through about human rights and about free media in the in the world after after this terrorist attack had happened. Um, and also, on a completely separate thing, a little bit personal, but I mean, you did say um, that your, your heritage is Sardinian, and you made, I think you said your parents have come here from Sardinian, um, and obviously you've come here and you've had all of these opportunities, and I don't understand why you, you feel like you associate with a party that 50% of which you know, actually admit to be openly, openly racist, and you want to actually input into something that is, that is, uh, is, is going to stop other people being able to have those same opportunities. I'm just going to ask question and answer. Okay, there's two things there. First thing about the I never said it's for our own good. I was actually going to use an example when people actually said, if you've got nothing to hide, you know, what's the problem with people stooping into it? I'm actually coming from the um, area where I'm actually against that line of thinking because your privacy is your privacy and it should be respected. So I think you got me the, the, the way around there. Just being uh, in general, you give, and, you know, it actually helps unite people against this. Terrorism or this fear of terrorism, yeah. and then that is used. If, for if we look at terrorism, you look at UK, it's an anti war party. We're actually really against that foreign policy at the moment. We're not warmongers. We, that's one thing we want to pull out. Racism, racism. racism, right? Okay, let's, 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 let's get this racism one thing off for all. Right, because let me just tell you something. I wonder, I look around the room, and you know, there's going to be a couple of people who um, suffer from racism. Mm -hmm. I suffer from racism. Yeah? And I can tell you how horrific it is. So I understand racism very well. And when I was growing up, you know, I, was, I tell you, as a kid, you pray to whatever God will listen to you during the night so you don't have to wake up in the morning for the fear of what's going to happen the day after, verbally or physical. So I can tell you, it's abhorrent, and I'll never, ever condone any such actions. Now let me tell you why. No, 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 but I said, you're, you've got this perception of racism is. That's because you probably don't understand what racism is. Now it takes an immigrant to point out what racism is. No, let me explain. No, I've been asked a question, so you should give me the respect to answer it. Okay? 
Now let me tell you what racism. Look up the dictionary and you'll see the definition. And it will say when a race is treated as inferior or superior to that of another race, okay? Now let's look at UK. They say, no matter where you are from the world, shake your head, but they say, no matter where you are from the world, European, African, um, American, Caribbean, Indian, Pakistani, Australian, it doesn't matter, you are to be treated as equals. Now, let's compare that, let's compare that to the European... Let the to speak, please. Let's compare that to the European Union and the parties who support the European Union. They say, if you are from the European Union, you are to be given preferential treatment to that of anywhere else in the world. So if you are from Europe, you will be treated more preferentially to African, Caribbeans, Americans, Indians, Pakistanis, other people around the world. So by dictionary definition, my dear, I have to tell you, dictionary I'm from Nottingham. I'm from Nottingham. No, no. Nottingham speak, love. Nottingham speak. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. By dictionary definition. By dictionary definition. By dictionary. By dictionary. I suggest. I suggest you. I will finish on this point very quickly. I suggest you read the dictionary, because by dictionary definition, by dictionary, I will finish this sentence, by dictionary definition, you know, it's the EU policy which is discriminatory and racist, by the dictionary. I didn't write the dictionary, that's what it is. You're welcome. No more questions, no more answers. You see, you like a nice man who has good morals, and are you not embarrassed for the fact that people who support your party? I, work, I used to be a charity fundraiser, I go to these towns around Nottingham, and I talk to people about developing charities. And the majority of people who are UK candidates or people who would fill me with racist hatred would be supportive of UK. And that's in fact, if you seem like somebody who's racist, you're not going to be able to do it. We are three quarters of an hour overrun, we'll let you go. I'd like you all to put your hands together for our candidates. might be concerned that a vote for you might be uh, a vote away from Labour and end up giving us a Conservative government again. What would you say to those people? Quite a few things. Um, I would say that um, there's an awful lot of people that have asked me that question. I say you have to vote for the policies that you believe in or nothing changes. 
because we are looking at a situation where no one's going to have big wins, so we are going to look at something where there's, there's going to be a government made up and an opposition made up of lots of small parties. That's what's going to happen anyway. In Nottingham East, there is a, la a strong Labour majority, so Tories are very unlikely to get in. Uh, and it's very important. I'm not just standing with the idea of, of the only idea being to win. The idea is also to change the mandate. If Labour wins with a massive great majority, for example, then they have the, the mandate to do what they want and nobody's actually have, no one's being heard. Um, it seems a bit, and uh, my background is in um, conflict resolution um, and also I've worked with uh, women who suffered domestic violence. And this idea of the tar of, of the tactical vote, yeah. it kind of reminds me sometimes of someone saying, I'm going to stay with this person because they promised to beat me slightly less. And I think, well, whatever happens, we have to stand up against things. If you believe in the policies of the party, whether it's green or whatever, vote for that. If you don't believe in Labour policy, don't vote Labour. If you're angry that they have voted in with the Tories, £30 billion pounds more cuts in a, in, a, in a vote that was taken in January, don't vote for Labour. Vote differently, vote with your hearts, because unless we vote for change, unless we're brave with our votes, nothing will change. And even if we take a step and have a, a bigger proportion of the votes, that will get listened to before UKIP ever won any seats. Before the other parties started leaning further and further to the right because they were scared. If we have a larger proportion of the votes, and we are much bigger than UKIP now, and we're bigger than Lib Dems, so we are a voice to be reckoned with now. And at, at local level, there's something else that I have to say. We have a hugely uh, monolithic Labour Council. There's no there's democracy in it, it's just Labour. And so we need more voices in there. So. Thank you very much. Cheers. Okay. Hello. Quick question to camera. Um, voters that are interested in voting for you yes. may be concerned that a vote for you is, is a vote away from one of the main parties. How would you answer their concerns? Um, for, specifically for Nottingham East, well, we're actually the main opposition in Nottingham East. If you look at um, just last year, um, we actually won the European elections in Nottinghamshire. So if you don't want Labour, there's only the most vote to to I'm afraid you can just the vote for you. Um, but what we're standing for is against all of the other establishment parties. Lib Lab Park. You've got a choice. The choice is you have a more of the same or you want change. If you want change, we're in because we're the only ones who can actually be Labour. Okay, thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers, Ben. I think everyone else is gone, so uh, we're going to go to.